Good morning. Welcome to Liberty Church. Thank you for joining us in worship virtually as we celebrate this Lord's Day. It's uh, important during this time of quarantine, which we've now experienced about, about a month of this, to remind ourselves to stay connected to one another. And I'm so encouraged by many stories of uh, members of Liberty Church who are doing this remotely via Zoom or phone calls or FaceTime, things like that. Various small groups are staying connected. I think that's just uh, very important during this time not to uh, remain too isolated from one another. And one of the best ways that we can stay connected is not just through phone and Zoom and things like that, but to pray for one another. And I want to encourage you during this week to really reach out and ask others of any prayer needs that they may have that they're going through, uh, and to commit this week to, to praying for one another, praying for your church during this, uh, this difficult time. I would ask for special prayer for the Hancock family as uh, we just found uh, news that Carl Hancock has passed away uh, last night. And so please keep the entire Hancock family in your thoughts and prayers. Uh, the friends of Carl who had many, many friends, especially here at Liberty Church, who, is, who are going to miss him dearly. Please pray for, for them. As we gather together for worship, this is the Lord's day. This is the day that God has called us to come and worship Him, and celebrate Him. And though we can't do this together, we are doing this symbolically together, uh, everyone in their own homes. And let's take some time just to silently reflect and meditate upon our God and His Word by looking at Psalm 46. In Psalm 46, the psalmist writes that God is our refuge and our strength, a very present help in trouble. And that's what we're experiencing. We're, we're experiencing times of trouble. But what's the psalmist's response to that trouble? Verse 2, therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives away. Why? Because we have a faithful God, a God who loves his children, who knew about the coronavirus and all, everything that would uh, fall out from this well before it all happened, who cares for us and will provide all the needs that we have. Let us come before this awesome, great, merciful God, worshiping him. The call to worship from Psalm 18, verses 1 through 2. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress. And my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold, I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, and I am saved from my enemies. Let us pray. Father God, we call upon you, and you are indeed worthy to be praised. And Lord, we have many enemies and some in the form of, of various people, perhaps, but right now in the form of a virus, of a pandemic. It's causing much angst, much anxiety, much isolation. Lord, and many of uh, your children are worried or concerned. Father, there's uh, even loss of income. There's potential for losing jobs. Father, there's potential for losing life in light of this uh, terrible disease. But Lord, also in light of this, we believe that you are sovereign, that you sit upon your throne, that you are the king of heaven and earth. And we gather now during this time, this hour to two hours of time, to cast our hearts upon you, all of our anxieties, all of our stress, 
because you can handle it. You call us to do that. Father, and we come before you as a great and awesome God, and we ask that you would be pleased with the worship that we bring to you today. Hear our prayers, hear our worship, and may you be honored. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Our confession of sin is taken from Psalm 51, 1 through 4. Pray this prayer with me as you're at home. Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love. According to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and and done what is evil in your sight, so that you may be justified in your words and blameless in your judgment. We are honest with ourselves. We realize that the psalmist's prayer here is a prayer that we all can pray to God every single day, that we are full of iniquity and that we need to be cleansed from our sin. Spend some time now silently confessing to your God your own particular sins that you've committed against him. Hear now the words of pardon from 1 Peter. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, And whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. And a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. Praise God that you, you who believe, are honored by God, adopted into his family, as dear and loved children. That is praiseworthy indeed. I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to the Gospel of Luke, the 19th chapter. We'll be starting in verse 45, reading through chapter 20, verse 18. As is our custom, I invite you all to stand with me to honor the reading of God's Word. We can do this corporately, even though we're separated. This is the Word of the Lord. And he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold, saying to them, It is written, My house shall be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. And he was teaching daily in the temple. The chief priests and the scribes and the principal men of the people were seeking to destroy him. But they did not find anything they could do, for all the people were hanging on his words. One day, as Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel, the chief priests and the scribes with the elders came up and said to him, Tell us by what authority you do these things, or who is it that gave you this authority? And he answered them, I will ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And they discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say we did not believe him. But if we say from man, all the people will stone us to death, for they are convinced that John was the prophet. So they answered that they did not know where it came from. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. And he began to tell the people this parable. A man planted a vineyard and led it out to tenants and went into another another country for a long while. When the time came, he sent a servant to the tenants so that they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard. But the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent another servant but they also beat and mistreated him shamefully and sent him away empty-handed. And he sent a third. This one 
they wounded and cast out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my beloved son. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Let us kill him, so that the inheritance may be ours. And they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When they heard this, they said, Surely not. But he looked directly at them and said, What then is this that is written? The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces, and when it falls on anyone, it will crush them. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Please be seated. And please join me in prayer as we lift up our petitions to God. Heavenly Father, we come to you today with reverence and joy. I echo the words of the psalmist we read earlier, that you are our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We thank you that you are not merely far off, but that you're near to us, and we can have joy in our hearts because of that. We thank you that you are a fortress, and in that fortress we can have safety, protection, and comfort. Lord, I thank you for this blessing of corporate worship, and even though it's unusual that we do this in our homes separately, we do bring our worship to you, the triune God, the Father, the Son, the Holy Ghost, and to you alone. Thank you for this one day in seven, which is a gift to us, and a glimpse of what it will be like to worship you for all eternity. I think I can speak for the entire congregation that we all long for the time when we can be back together uh, in person. And I just pray that this longing will, will last for a long time and that once we can meet back together, we'll still cherish it all the more and look forward to that eternal worship, uh, the kingdom ethic that Pastor Nathan has taught us about when we'll worship you for eternity. Lord, we're weak and we struggle, we have many requests to bring to you. I want to lift up all the families of our church. Uh, during this time, I pray for the fathers, that they may lead their um, families well. I pray for the moms, that they can be tight as two women, to love their husbands and children and be good keepers at home. I pray for all the children, uh, that they can honor their parents, get along with their siblings, and grow in the fruits of the Spirit even while they're in close quarters. Lord, I lift up all the unsaved that we are in contact with, the neighbors, friends, coworkers, family members. This is a time when our mortality is on our minds as a nation. And I just pray you help us to use these opportunities that you give us to share the good news of your gospel. I lift up the unemployed. I lift up the elderly in our congregation. I especially lift up the, our friends and uh, members at Carroll Lutheran Village that you protect them. Lord, I lift up our widows and widowers and others that might be living alone. I just pray you comfort them, make sure they um, have contact with others and do not feel isolated. Lord, as Pastor Nathan mentioned, I just ask that our church at this time might actually become more unified, even though we're separated physically. I pray that relationships can be strengthened New relationships can be made and the body of Christ can uh, come together and encourage each other. I know even this week, Beth and I received um, encouraging notes in the mail, phone calls, um, the video chats and things. I just pray that this can continue and that we can do this for each other during this time. Lord, I lift up our leaders, federal, state, local, church. It's a tough time, tough decisions. I pray you'll give them wisdom Lord, I also lift up uh, our, our country and nation. I pray that our civil liberties and religious liberties will not be um, um, lost. I pray that they won't be diminished. I pray you help us to know how to react if this continues too long. But I thank you for the liberties we have, and I just pray that we can keep them. Lord, I lift up, uh, I guess I'd call it a pastoral concern. This is a time when there's potentially idle time that we have. Uh, there's a temptation to 
watch things that may not be edifying. Lord, I just pray that you'll give all the families and church members discernment and wisdom as they decide what to watch on TV, on the internet. Um, there's lots of bad things on Netflix and Amazon. Just help us to be discerning. Help us to remember um, the words of Philippians to put our minds on things that are true and honest and pure and have virtue. Lord, I also pray for the members of our church as, um, as I've read, I read in the uh, media, one industry that's thriving right now, sadly, is pornography. And I just pray that you'll protect our church, our members, uh, from the scourge of this um, sin. If we have members involved in this, I pray that you'll convict them, and help them to repent, and get help and encouragement from others, and be held accountable. Um, Lord, just please guide our, our thoughts and our minds that we may use this time to focus on things that are good and pure. Lord, I do lift up specifically some prayers in our congregation. Again, I pray for the Hancock family. I pray for all the friends, the dear friends of um, Mr. Hancock. He was a, a beloved member of this congregation, um, viewed as a father figure to many. I know as a young man, I had the privilege of working with him over at the church, oh, I'm sorry, the school, when it was being built or one of the modular units were being assembled. Uh, I think I was just in high school during the summer. And to this day, I still have um, some carpentry skills and construction skills that he taught me. So we thank you for his impact in our lives. Lord, I lift up Jan Duty as she goes through chemo. We know this is tough. We pray that you give her strength. Lord, we lift up our school. We lift up the parents, the teachers, the students, and staff as they adjust. And give them grace and patience. Help the students to learn during these difficult times. And lastly, we lift up our uh, missionaries um, throughout the world. Pray that you'll comfort them and give them strength. I also lift up Mr. Chaz Tracy, who awaits surgery. We just pray that the things will fall into place, that he can get the needed tests uh, that he needs before the surgery, uh, so that the surgery can happen on time. We're going to lift up the body of Christ here. Let us focus on living out the, the two great commandments, to love God and love each other. And I pray that we can do that diligently. And as Pastor Nathan mentioned, I, I echo the prayer that we, be, that we be people of prayer. May we maybe even develop new discipline of praying for each other during this time when we have additional time. Um, help us to do that this week. Help us to cast our cares upon you when we get worried. Remind us to be on our knees and looking up to you. Help pray you build our faith through this, uh, that we know that you're our only hope and that you truly are our refuge and strength. And Lord, I close this prayer with the last two verses of Psalm 46. Help us to live like this, where you teach us to be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us, and the God of Jacob is our fortress. Lord, thank you that you're with us. I pray that you'll give us your peace, and I pray you help us to live in this confidence and assurance this week as we go about whatever you have planned for us. In Christ's name I pray, amen. Beloved, at this time in our service, we continue to worship our God through the giving of our gifts and offerings. God has been so gracious to us in providing for us, and we show our gratitude back to him by giving him a portion of what he has blessed us with. God uses these ties to advance his kingdom here and beyond throughout the world. Since we cannot give our ties in person, I want to encourage you to continue supporting the ministries of the church through online giving or by dropping your check in the mail. Let's pray together. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your goodness and grace shown to us through your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, in providing him for us who has taken away our sins and given us new life. Thank you for not only providing for us eternally, but also for your faithful provision for us in this life daily. 
So, Lord, we give back to you a portion of what you have given us, seeking your blessing upon these gifts for the sake of your kingdom. And, Father, we also praise you for the gift of your word, which tells us how we can have eternal life with you through the word incarnate, the Lord Jesus Christ. Oh, Father, we pray that you would now fill us with your spirit, that our hearts would be attuned to your mighty word, and that you would do a mighty work in our hearts through it. We ask all of these things in the precious name of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Beloved, if you have your Bibles with you, I encourage you to turn back to Luke 19, verses 45. And we'll be reading also through a portion, going through a portion of uh, chapter 20 as well. And as we look through the word today, we also think about how the word intersects with our lives. And long after this COVID crisis has passed, I would imagine that political science majors and historians will be studying this period in our nation's history for decades to come. Because it raises the issue of authority. How much power does the government have to limit the freedoms of its citizens in the pursuit of the common good? In other words, how does the governing authority of the state intersect or conflict with the freedoms guaranteed to us by the Constitution. Who has the ultimate authority? The state or the people? And the reason I mention this is because the issue of authority runs throughout today's passage. Who has the ultimate authority? Why, it's a question that the religious leaders asked Jesus in verse 2 when they said, who gave you the authority to do these things? And they were referring to two things. The first was Jesus' clearing out of the temple of the money changers and the merchants the day after Palm Sunday, which Luke records in chapter 19, verses 45 and 46. And after he drove them out, he took control over the priest's domain, the temple. And Jesus had to clean out the temple because the priests, in their authority, had made a complete mess of it. What should have been a place of prayer had become instead a place of corruption, which the priests had condoned and encouraged. They allowed the temple to be a marketplace where God's people were being ripped off. Now, how did this come about? Well, Jews from all over the Roman provinces would come to offer sacrifices at the temple as prescribed by the law. And they couldn't travel with the animals that were needed for the sacrifices, so they had to purchase them there at the temple out of necessity where unscrupulous sellers would take advantage of their situation and charge exorbitant prices for the animals that the priests had given their stamp of approval as unblemished. And the reason why the religious leaders condoned the fleecing of the flock was because they were receiving a kickback from the sellers who would give them a portion of the profits to the priests, making them very wealthy. The chief priests, while well, they were running a lucrative operation that makes the mafia look like a Boy Scout troop. And it was the same with the money changers. By law, every Jewish male was required to pay an annual temple tax of a half shekel. And people coming from all over the, the world had to exchange their currency into the temple currency in order to pay the tax. And again, the money changers took full advantage of a necessity 
and they charged them outrageous rates of exchange, all under the direction of the chief priest, Ananias, who profited from it. So there was a big mess to clean up in the court of the Gentiles. The court of the Gentiles, which should have been a quiet place to pray and to hear God's word. But under the priest's authority, it became a clamoring, stinking cesspool of corruption, which was dubbed Ananias' Bazaar. And when Jesus removed the swindlers from the temple, their cash cow was slaughtered. And the religious leaders, well, they didn't like it. In fact, they hated Jesus for it. And Jesus' teaching only added to their animosity. He had restored sanity and sanctity back to the sanctuary so that he could teach. And his teaching was in direct opposition to what the people had heard from the religious leaders. Because notice what Luke writes in verse 1. He writes, Jesus was teaching the people in the temple and preaching the gospel. And the gospel was 180 degrees different from what the religious leaders had taught the people. And Jesus confronted the religious leaders on their false teaching right there on their own turf, right there in the temple, or what they thought was their own turf. And speaking truth to power, Jesus rebuked them, saying in Matthew 23, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites! For you are like whitewashed tombs, which outwardly appear beautiful but within are full of dead men's bones and all uncleanliness. So you also outwardly appear righteous to others, but within you are full of hypocrisy and lawlessness. Jesus had brought the dark intentions of their hearts to light, and he revealed their true character of what they were like, and he also attacked their false teaching, which had crippled the people spiritually and kept them from knowing God and his grace. He said in Matthew 23, the Pharisees, you preach, but you do not practice what you preach. Well, the Pharisees, they tie up heavy burdens that are hard to bear, and they lay them on people's shoulders, but they themselves are not willing to move them with their finger they do all their deeds to be shown by, to be seen by others. You see, the Pharisees, they wanted to control the people. They wanted to keep them enslaved by teaching them that the way to be right with God was to follow their man-made rules and regulations, which had bastardized God's law. And these rules and regulations were crushing and they were deadening to the people's souls. And beloved, isn't that the way of the human heart? To work out of your own self-interest. In your own self-interest to want to dominate others. And to try and to control them for your own ends and means. Why, isn't that the reason that the mantra of the baby boomer generation was, was what? Was question authority. Because authority can so easily slip into tyranny. And yet here we see Jesus. Jesus spoke as one with authority. He didn't follow the man-made traditions of other teachers, but he spoke God's word as it was meant to be taught because he is the word incarnate and truth in the flesh. And he preached this gospel to a downtrodden, oppressed people who were suffocating under the religious legalism of the Pharisees. Jesus taught 
that you have a you can have a relationship with the Lord and you have that relationship with the Lord by faith alone in which he bestows his grace upon you and unlike the Pharisees Jesus' teaching didn't lead to tyranny no this this good news leads to freedom not bondage he said in Matthew 11, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden under the weight of striving to be right with God by your legalistic rules. And I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart. You will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. Jesus taught this marvelous truth. Which was worlds apart from what the Pharisees taught. Because of it they hated him all the more for it. Because he threatened their power. He threatened their position and their profit. So they had to do something. They had to do something. But what? Well, they tried to trip him up. To get him in a kind of a gotcha moment. Where they could use something against him that he said. So they asked him, by whose authority do you do these things? And they thought, you know, if we can get him to just say something, just a little sound bite that can be viewed as blasphemous, then we can nail him with some bad PR and separate the people's affections from him. And yet Jesus, being the Son of God and being able to discern their motives, well, he didn't take the bait. He knew the question they asked was not a genuine question, but a trap. So he masterfully responds to their question with a question of his own. He says in verses 3 and 4, I also ask you a question. Now tell me, was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And like the Pharisees who questioned Jesus, Jesus' question to them also was one about authority. Who was John's authority? Was he commissioned by God? Or was he preaching under his own authority? And with that one question, with just that one question, the religious leaders found themselves between a rock and a hard place. For if they acknowledge that the truth that the truth that John the Baptist was teaching that well they would have to acknowledge that he was a prophet a prophet sent by God to preach repentance and if they did that then the people would say to them well you all have some explaining to do why don't you Pharisees follow him too if you acknowledge that he was from God what kind of religious leaders are you? And what's also significant, if they acknowledged that John the Baptist was sent by God, then they would also have to acknowledge that Jesus, too, was sent by God. Because John affirmed that Jesus was indeed the Messiah. When he said in John 1, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For I have seen and I have borne witness that he is the Son of God. Well, they could admit that Jesus was the Messiah. They would be answering their own question with disastrous results for them. But they also couldn't say, well, John, John came with his own authority. He didn't speak for God. Because if they did that, if they did that, well, they would have started a riot. 
because John was immensely popular with the people. So what did they do? They simply said, well, we don't know. And they claimed ignorance, which is ironic considering that this group of men prided themselves on knowing all things spiritual. And Jesus responds by saying in verse 8, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. Checkmate. With just one question. With just one question. Jesus trips them up and thwarts their plan. They get trapped in their very own trap. And this reminds us of Psalm 2, which Pastor Nathan preached on last week, where the psalmist writes, Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed ones, saying, Let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. The nations rise up against God in a rebellion to try and cast off the Lord's righteous reign over them. But here Psalm 2 says it's a fool's errand because the mighty king over the universe thwarts their every attempt at resting God's authority over them. And isn't this incident just like a small microcosm of Psalm 2? Only in this instance, it's not the leaders of other nations. No, it's the leaders of God's own people who are trying to thwart the Lord's anointed and to reject his authority. But like Psalm 2 says, it's a fool's errand. It's a fool's errand to try and stop the plans and the purposes of God. And the following verses display that truth where we see Jesus who is in absolute, complete control of his mission and his ministry. And he does that by showing, by, he shows that by telling a parable in verses 9 through 16. And this va- parable makes it very clear that Jesus knows exactly what these leaders are about. He knows what's in their heart and what they plan to do. Although Jesus directs this parable to the crowd, the priests, while they get the message, they know it's about them. While Jesus' other parables have, may have been obscure, requiring interpretation, this parable of the wicked workers was very easy for the people to discern since it was steeped in Old Testament symbolism. For example, when Jesus talks about a man planting a vineyard, they would know that he was referring to Israel, since the Old Testament repeatedly represents Israel as a vineyard that the Lord had planted. Israel as a vineyard was very much a part of their national consciousness, the same way that we would associate a bald eagle with America by looking at a bald eagle. And the owner who planted the vineyard in the parable, of course, represents the Heavenly Father, who granted to the Israelites the land to tend, and the workers, of course, symbolize the spiritual leaders of the nation. And knowing their national history, Jesus' listeners would also recognize that the servants who the owner sends represents the past prophets the Lord sent to warn the people of their apostasy and their rebellion against the Lord's authority. And in the parable, each servant is treated worse than the previous one. Each is persecuted for being the Lord's messenger because the leaders reject the message. Well, in verse 13, the long-suffering owner decides to send his beloved son. Maybe, maybe then, the wicked workers 
will receive him. Maybe then the wicked workers will respect him and listen to him and bow to his authority. And of course, Jesus puts himself in this parable as the son. And notice that the father calls him my beloved son. And that little detail is significant because Jesus is referring back to the time of his baptism in Luke 3, when the heavenly father said, you are my beloved son with whom I am well pleased, affirming Jesus and confirming him as the Messiah. So what's Jesus doing here? He's subtly stating who he is and what authority he has as the Son of God. And he's also depicting the, the loving kindness of the Father who does not give up on his people even in their rebellion. But he sends at last, not a servant, but his very own beloved son. But once again, even the beloved son is rejected in this parable. And he is murdered by the workers outside the vineyard, which is a depiction of Jesus' own death that was to come just a few days later as he was taken outside the city gate to be crucified. And as we said before, Jesus knew exactly what these religi religious leaders were all about, that they had murder in their hearts. And Jesus knew exactly how his life would end. But in doing so, they would only be fulfilling the plan of God. Their evil would be used to accomplish the sovereign good purposes of the Lord in sending his son to be the perfect sacrifice for our sins. For not even the evil rebellion of the nations can thwart the loving purposes of God. That he will have the ultimate victory just as Psalm 2 predicted, which says, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. As, ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage and the ends of the earth your possession. But what does Jesus do? He ends this parable by asking another question. In verse 16, he says, what will the owner do to the wicked tenants? And then he goes to answer his own question by giving another prediction. That the Lord will come and destroy those tenants and give the vineyard to others. So he ends this parable with a severe warning you leaders and this nation will face judgment for rejecting me, for rejecting me and my authority as king. And instead, others will share in my kingdom. I will give my vineyard to them. And this is exactly what happened. Jesus' warning to the religious leaders and the nations bore fruit in the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D., and then Jesus' warning in the parable that the vineyard, God's kingdom, would go to others was fulfilled as Gentiles embraced the gospel and as they bowed their hearts to King Jesus, they came into his kingdom, which the Jews had rejected as a nation. Now Jesus wasn't just giving them a new warning. We find the same warning in Psalm 2 which predicted the coming of the Messiah and warns that any nation or leaders that rebel against Christ, against God's Son, will know his judgment. In verse 10, the psalmist writes, Now therefore, O kings, be wise. Be warned, O rulers of this earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice 
We're trembling. Kiss the Son, the beloved Son, Jesus Christ, lest he be angry and you perish in the way. For his wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in him. And then moving on, Jesus added to his warning. In verses 17 and 18, he quotes from Psalm 118, which points to him, that he is the stone that the builders rejected that has become the chief cornerstone. He was rejected by the builders of the nation, the Jewish leaders. They rejected his authority and they sought to have him crucified. But he rose again from the dead. And in rising from the dead, he became the cornerstone, the foundation of his church. And Paul uses this imagery in Ephesians 2 to give us this, this glorious vision of what it means to be in Christ's kingdom. He writes that Christ the foundation stone of his church. He is building his kingdom from people of all nations. And we are being fitted together, connected and united as one, like stones in a living temple where his spirit dwells. So what does it mean to be in his kingdom? It means that that you have bowed your heart and your life to King Jesus. That you are trusting in him alone and what he has done for you in dying for your sins and then giving you new life. A new life under his reign and under his authority. So there's a warning for us as well in these verses. Look at verse 18. Jesus says, everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. And when it falls on anyone, it will crush him. Now what is Jesus saying here? Well, Jesus is not only the cornerstone of the church, but he's also a stumbling stone for those who choose not to live under his rule. And how is Jesus like a stumbling stone for those who don't accept his authority? Well, we find that this is all very relevant to the way that we live our lives. If we live our lives according to our own authority, and if we build our lives on any other foundation but Christ, then what happens? Then we find that our lives will break into pieces. After all, if Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life, and we choose to live our lives apart from that truth, and go against the way that he designed us to live, then what will happen? Well, we will be shattered. Take, for example, the way that the Lord has designed relationships and the expression of sexuality in marriage. He offers us such beauty and wonder in that design but when we go our own way, we stumble. and We experience pain. Because Jesus is the truth. And when we kick against the truth, we stumble. And we find out that the truth hurts. Suppose someone says, you know, my truth says that hooking up with someone else is it's fine. Sex with no relationship, with no commitment, why, it's freeing. It's fulfilling. 
Why, it makes me feel powerful. It makes me feel alive and wanted and desirable. And yet, how will that person feel over time? What will be the result as they keep giving themselves away to one person and then another and then another and then another? Well, they will feel used. They will feel abused, tossed aside like an old rag. Or what about the person who says, what's wrong with porn? It's not hurting anyone. I take a lot of pleasure in it. It's, it's like my daily comfort food while, when I'm stressed. But over time, you find that the very thing that you thought would serve you ends up enslaving you. And you serve it as you are, feel driven to do just one more click. Or you may say, well, I'm going to wrap my security, my identity, and my work, and my success, and my degrees, and my popularity, and my blog posts, and my appearance, my relationships, because that's where I find my fulfillment. And then what happens? Well, you stumble over the truth. And when you do, you find that the truth hurts. Because you wake up one day and you say to yourself, well, this just isn't working anymore. Why? Why do I feel so empty inside? Or let's consider just one more scenario. You believe that you are basically a good person whose act of kindness are like steps on the stairway to heaven. But then what happens? You stumble and you fall over Christ and his word, which says all your good deeds are but filthy rags because they're done with mixed motives of self-interest where you want to be noticed or well thought of by others. And in fact, no one, no one can have eternal life with God based on their own sense of self-righteousness. For we find that we stumble over the scripture that says, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Our words, our deeds, our heart attitudes separate us from a holy and just God. And should we die in rebellion against Christ, we would find that he's not only a rock, a stumbling rock, but we would find that he is a crushing rock as we fall under the weighty just judgment for all of our sin and living apart from his authority. Proverbs 14.2 sums it up well, that there is a way that seems right to a person, but in the end, it leads to death. What a horrible, horrible thing would it be for you to live life apart from Christ and not, know that, and not know life to its fullest in rejecting his authority and then to die apart from Christ and be crushed by his just judgment? And it's especially painful when we realize all along that the very things, the very things that we strive for are found in following Christ, in being under his authority. It's ironic, isn't it, that in order to find freedom, we need to come under authority. It seems counterintuitive, doesn't it? But when you come under Christ's authority, you find all the things that you were looking for in having a relationship with him. You find joy, peace, purpose, identity, and fulfillment. So you decide, whose life is it anyway? Who's really in authority?
you are King Jesus. Let's pray. Oh, gracious Father, how we thank you that you sent your beloved Son, the beloved Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, to take upon himself all of our sins, all of the wickedness of our heart, all of our disobedience to your authority and how you have designed us to be. So we thank you, Lord, that you have washed away all of our sins. And in doing so, Lord, that you are knitting us together to be like living stones in a temple where your Holy Spirit dwells. Oh, Lord, this is such a glorious vision that we can barely keep, put our minds around it. So all we can do is thank you for it and seek to live under your wonderful authority where there is life, where there is freedom, where there is joy, peace, and fulfillment. Oh, Lord, we pray for those who do not know you. We ask that if there be any listening today, Lord, that you would be at work in their hearts that they would come to know you, that they would come to put themselves under your kind and loving yoke. For we know that your yoke is easy and your burden is light. Oh, Father, we pray that you would be at work in each of our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. Beloved, as we uh, close our service, Let's hear the benediction from Jude verses 23, from 24 and 25. Beloved, receive his blessing. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God, our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forevermore. Amen.